Hello everyone, this is Aldrin Guerrero and welcome to Thursday Live Lessons. I almost said Aloha Friday Live Jam. Because <laughs> <laughs> I went in with the Aldrin Guerrero first. Usually it's like, hello and welcome to Thursday Live Lessons. My name is Aldrin Guerrero. I'm joined by Mr. Magic Mike. What's up, Magic? <laughs> How's it going, guys? <laughs> Mr. Aaron, the voice now. Come on. So what's up, Aaron? What's up? Mr. Kahai, the legend for again. Say what's up, Kahai? What's up? And we are here once again. Very special episode today. We have Magic Mike. I'm trying to explain some... You know, some music theory stuff, some just music things in general. He is our resident expert for music, so you can ask him whatever question you want. And that's actually how the show works. The show works with uh, just, you know, we're here. We're ready to answer any and all of your questions. Maybe questions that we got in this past week, past month, year, whatever, you know, through emails and stuff. Or uh, we are live. So this is a Thursday live lesson. We do have a live chat. You guys can ask us whatever question uh, that you want to ask us, you know, regarding the ukulele. And, you know, if you're having... Anything, if you're having a hard time with anything, get you're stuck anywhere, just let us know. Um, we'll, I'll try to come up with the best answer. We'll delegate and stuff, and we'll, t- we'll all talk, we'll brainstorm, and give you the best answer possible, all right? So with that said... Wait, there's an there's there's easy question first. Sure. No, guys, it's not an ukulele that I'm holding. No, yeah, no. This is Somebody, what? you're going to ask, yeah, what is this? Yeah. Is this like the ultra baritone? It's the... So. <laughs> <laughs> what would you call it? What, what would that be in music? Because there's like don't, the sopranissimo. Don't start that. Sopranissimo. <laughs> <sopranissimo. laughs> so what, it, what would it be? It's like baritone, bar, uh, like... Oh, no. But those yeah. those come from a different naming system. So. Okay. Oh, this would yeah, just be bass. Be, yeah. Okay. Although, although I, if you... If you <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to think about this uh, as a member of that family, you would probably just call it a contrabass ukulele. Oh, there you go. It's a contrabass uke. Ohana. Get, get on that marketing. <laughs> get on that marketing. You gotta separate yourself away from this U-based business. Because <laughs> they want to call it a bass ukulele. Yeah. It'd be cooler sounding if it said Contra contrabass bass ukulele. Uke. Hot damn. <laughs> right out of the gate. Here we go, guys. I just, I, you, yeah. you just sold one. <laughs> Where could I find one of these? Where can I find you to find one of these? Uh, you could find me and the contrabass ukulele at Quiet Music and Sound. That's where I yeah. work normally. Quiet Music, do we have a banner? <laughs> <laughs> Add right off the bat. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we are the gangs, the gangs here. So let's get started. Kahai, hit us up with the first question. Uh, do you want to... Uh, talk about uh, Alan's video. Oh yeah, so we uh, so we watched Alan's video. Alan, um, he's uh, he's a great, uh, facet, yeah. He's a great uh, long time member. He's he's a great uke player. He's been um, you know improving a lot throughout the years that we've seen him. So it's just kind of nice to see someone's progress um, you know throughout all these years. So Alan was playing at the uh, most recent Denver Ukulele Festival, and he posted a video of him playing a song called Ulu Palakua, and. Um, I know he just kind of wanted our thoughts on it and stuff. If you guys want to check it out, it is over on the UU Plus forum. You can watch that video. Um, it's titled uh, Uke, uh, Denver Uke Fest Open Mic. So you can go check that out over there. Uh, we'll probably have the link below for those of you folks who are, you know, are watching this. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, I like the, uh, you know, I like the video. I, I think Alan, like I was saying, he's actually gone a long, you know, a long way. I like the embellishments that he's, you know, that he's putting in there during the vamps. He did a nice little role. And um, a role that uh, I recognize as, um, you know, one one of the more harder roles. Because the role that we teach here at Ukulele Underground is that, you know, pinky ring middle pointer. It goes like this. But the role that I was watching him do is he actually does the upstrum with the thumb and then, like, starts the roll. So he goes out. So... When I was listening to it, I was kind of like thinking, oh, is he doing like 16th notes there? Because that's what you would do in a Hawaiian strum. But he's uh, he's getting that same tone by using that, um, you know, a little bit more of a complicated role. To, you know, to give that kind of 16th note feel. So I'll do the, the 16th note. You know, it sounds pretty similar, but actually the roll sounds even more full. 
You know, I, I like that he used that embellishment in that um, you know, in that song. And um, I I would say sixteen. No, I know like his other question. Uh, or he had another question it's about sixteen. No, yeah, previous yeah, and, question. Yeah, previous question. It has nothing to do with that. But I like how it kind of connects to this one because um, the count of that would be, you know, if we're if we're talking like music, it would be in a one and two and a three and four and a one and two and a three and four. Yeah. So that, huh? It's all you have to do like a pickup note. Yeah, pickup note. Yeah. So sixteenth pickup note. Yeah. yeah. So and uh like one so that's like four E and uh like would be the last beat of that, you know, uh of that measure before that pickup measure. So four E and uh so he has the and uh and a one and two and a three and four and a one and two and a three and four. So it's it's a little bit more of a complicated rhythm than just your regular one and two and three and four and if you ever like, if other or mm-hmm. other members ever had a hard time uh, counting Hawaiian, mm-hmm. that might be it too, right? Like yeah. you have to count that yeah. and the one and two and yeah. the one and two. It's not just starting one, two, three. Right, four. right, right. Because it is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit complicated. And in Hawaiian music, I played with a lot of halals and stuff, and they like that kind of fast drum. And the, you know, the more kind of driving the strum is, the the better for the hula. Like if it's a fast hula, like ulu palakua, ulu palakua is not one of those like you know really soft and gentle kind of hulas. Ulu palakua um, talks about cowboys and stuff, so it's got you know it's got those a little bit more of swaying moves. It's it's a it's an active uh, hula. Um, so it's good to kind of do those you know, do those embellishments in there. And then he added kind of this uh, this solo, you know, or or an instrumental part that kind of just follows the um, you know follows the chords. So he just kind of does that. Um, I think he did it in C, and he was you know playing notes in C and uh, and adding those to the chords that are, are already in the song, which is great. You know, like um, trying to do something a little too complicated. So if he you know went away from the strum and did actual picking then it would sound too you know uh too empty and there would be a huge contrast in, in between the two uh you know the strumming the strumming parts and the parts that is picking so i'm glad he stuck to the strumming but just added little embellishments to the chords in there and it was really good what do you think Mike? you watched the video i did um you know i do like a lot of that extra rhythmic stuff i played with a lot of halals too and one of the things to remember for those of you who don't do hula is that there's not too much percussion. You know, a lot of times when we think of music, that driving beat, we think of a drummer. Mm. You know, a percussionist, a drum set going. If we pop all the way back to one of the first times I was here, we talked about mm. ipus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you had to go from something to an ipu. You, you, want, to, you want an ipu to jazz. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but the thing is that even with an ipu going, it's yeah. not necessarily the loudest instrument in the world. Yeah. And... They don't have a lot of other necessary percussion instruments going along with it. So when you keep adding all that extra rhythmic embellishment, you're actually doing the job or adding on where another a drummer who has like a bass drum and a snare and toms and cymbals and stuff, you're just adding into that that forward motion. And that's, you know, if you're going to play stuff like that, it's really important, especially if you're going to play it solo too. Mm-hmm. One thing I've noticed, if you're going to play a fast song solo, yeah, yeah. you got to have some of that, that push forward. Right. If you don't, right. man, your your song is just gonna like slide there, mm-hmm. and it's not really gonna go anywhere. And it's gonna feel. We've all had this feeling if you've played long enough, where you know it's a three minute song that feels like three hours long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Hawaiian songs are like basically just verse, 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 verse. Yeah, yeah. So the same chords over and over and over again. Yeah. So if you don't push that song forward. You're going to mm. feel, it's going to feel like Groundhog Day where you're just doing the same thing over oh, and over sense. and over again. Because mm. there are definitely song, there are definitely Hawaiian songs like that. Mm. Especially when the Halal decides they're going to do each verse like twice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's like six verses. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's 12. That so is, you're just. And plus the vamps. <laughs> plus the vamps. So you're just there. So it's like, you know, you kind of end up in that Groundhog mm. Day scenario yeah. where it's like, where am I even in this song mm. anymore? <laughs> you know, uh, very very famous uh, Hawaiian musician um, did that song Kawaii Punahele. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was that again? Kelly Rochelle. Rochelle. So Kelly Rochelle did that Kawaii Punahele. I love that song, but it's way too long. <laughs> that song is <laughs> super long. Like I think it's like five verses maybe, it and is. he repeats it, and it's already a pretty slow song. <laughs> I mean, most of his big hits yeah. are ballad, Hawaiian ballads. So <laughs> I, I, I. I on the side, one of the things mm-hmm. I do is I teach, I help teach a Polynesian music class at the local high school, and we do a couple mm-hmm. of his songs. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, <clears throat> it goes on. Yeah, and it goes on. I was there was that one time I was here and me and Kahai were talking. Like I heard that song where it goes, 
que aloha. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. Sometimes I really like that song, but sometimes I really hate, hate that, that song. <laughs> if I'm not in the mood for it. And because that song is so long and he repeats that line so much, they're just like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, and that's part of, and that is one of the hard parts with Hawaiian music yeah. because there is a lot of repetition mm-hmm. in it. Whether, like, you know, uh, I do this, another song I love doing is the, the Palihua by Amy Gilliam. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And... We did that song at the show where the mechanic was singing. Yeah, right? that's yeah. right. Yeah. So there's that was that part uh, where they where they that at the end of every couple verses the, they they throw in the polyhua part. Yeah. And man, it's like if you that song is slow, and if you don't move that song along, you are gonna get lost as to where you're then actually yeah. what what's a, you're like what's yeah. the next verse? And, and it's funny because the, the chords are pretty like pretty standard up until you get to the polyhua part which like it and then it changes but you're pretty much just going what like one four, one four one four one four one four, one four, one four, one four. and then and that's a minor minor two <laughs> so four five attention. seven one you're just like one four one that's four one four and, and then you'll go to the four whenever it goes to the two and you are shot. Like, oh no <laughs> wrong chord so. I'm, and i'm guilty of that <laughs> <laughs> during the show so you're saying to use the rhythm like you know rhythmic techniques to push the song forward for especially for those songs yeah i mean it, adding in rhythmic embellishment is always good in the sense that you know if you're gonna i'll, I'll have it yeah. I might as well just do it. so if the song is just going to you know after a while this is gonna get real boring mm-hmm. you know I, yeah. and it's almost like hypnotic yeah you know in the sense that that's why you kind of lose yourself in it sometimes right. and you forget but, where but you if you are. just go even just this mm. Mm. yeah so the the rhythm yeah. kind of breaks it up mm. into manageable you know? pieces yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. exactly a lot of as a bass player a lot of times what i do is i will stick with one line and where I will throw in those type of things is like at the end of every four bars, at the mm-hmm. end of every eight bars, I'll do that. And it's a lot of people, I would tell everybody else, this is so that, you know, kind of if you're, if you're a little lost, you hear me do, you kind of know where we are. You're like, you know, yeah, like, yeah. okay, we've ended one mm-hmm. section. Mm-hmm. And it's a, for, so is that we, your job as a bass player to like let people know that that's what's, what's happening? Like, as part of it. As one of the as, things as, that you as, do? As part of it. Um, I, or I, I, I was going to say, I think um, Alan even mentioned before that he's played in, like, orchestras. I forget mm. what instrument he's played, but if you can imagine, like... Wait, was this the guy from the other week? Didn't he play the oboe? Uh, yeah, I think he might, uh-huh. yeah. Did he, didn't, he didn't, we have, didn't we mention some guy who, who had some other questions and he played oboe and he went to, like, Juilliard mm. or something? Oh, oh no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, we have multiple, but I think Alan. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, <laughs> sorry, Alan. No. I know. <laughs> we didn't need to laugh. Whichever of the eight, like whichever that, of the eight right? Alans you are, then <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of Alan. I'm an Al. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, like I think Alan has like, or he, I think he's mentioned mm. before that he has played like that kind of uh, style mm. of music, and it's like if you can imagine if you're playing um, like a classical piece or you're playing something where it's just like. You just have to hold the note for so Forever. many measures. Mm. And then after a while, you can kind of be like, oh, man. <laughs> Where am I? Like, what measure is this? <laughs> okay. Oh. I can totally sympathize with you because I, I, in orchestra, we have an orchestra here on Kauai mm. at the college. Mm. I play two different instruments in it mm. depending on the what they need. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I play upright bass. The other, time I pl- the other times I play percussion, which is more often. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, if you want a challenge to test your counting ability mm. play percussion in an orchestra mm. because i have i've had pieces mm. where it's like it's 400 measures of music <laughs> and i literally play like 12 notes mm-hmm. <laughs> and like- and it's like it's like <laughs> and then i look at the paper okay 167 wrists mm. 100, yeah, 167 <laughs> measures of rest. Then three, no, then three more notes. Then another 100 measures of rest. Yeah, but don't you like? Uh... And it, it can be, it can be too. Where right, like everybody else is not playing, and it's only you. So if you miss it, everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I fully, freely admit that whenever I get a part like that, oh, I just, oh, no. t- I just, I tell the conductor. Yeah. 
I'm gonna be lost by this time. <laughs> I <laughs> just cue me. Yeah. Just cue me. I will be like who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> I will just I will just keep looking at you when I think it's around that time. Yeah. When you stare right at me and go like that, I will go. <laughs> so, uh so Alan came in like a little late and he just came in. Yeah. So kinda of to summarize what we were just talking about is like uh, that you you liked that he added the role for that uh, rhythmic yeah yeah because yeah. um it, it does it does break it up because um what what Mike was talking about that he likes the little breaks you know in, in the rhythm pattern because it just you would just have that the thing is you can play it like that but then he did. Yeah, so it's good that he you know, he added yeah, those yeah. Right, right, right. So, by the way, hi, Alan. Hi. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry, I mistook you for the, the oboe guy. Let's uh, let's 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 play a little game. So, you said he was um <clears throat> he was he was an orchestra. <laughs> oh, I, uh, oh I, let's let's try to guess what he played, well, and then Alan tell us what what you actually you might, played. You might want you might want to hear this. What? Uh, I thought he was, but he said I yeah. played ukulele the guitar, so he didn't play. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would have been, been an answer really too. Yeah, been like, I, I would say he wasn't. Question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna play a game. I was like, oh, let's put stakes and stuff. Like, sorry. Uh, the winner we, buys we buys lunch play. next time Mike like, comes in. We can we get, keep guessing. He plays like viol All or four. something. He's looking at us like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, it's got four strings. <laughs> That's true. All right, so Kai, do you have another question for us? Uh, we had a question last week mm. um, that we didn't get to. So okay. <laughs> this is from Godzilla, or <laughs> his native okay. Gojira, right? I okay, yeah. He's Gojira. <laughs> uh, so it says, sometimes it seems like you can really get the groove by playing less. Mm. How do you figure out what to accent? Oh, so we have Resident Groove Man. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, bass, that's basically, you start the groove. You are where the groove starts and ends, right? A lot of That's, times, yeah. you are the heartbeat of you know of, of a band. If of a if a drummer's not there, you're basically the well. Heartbeat. What? Yeah. Well, what I teach mm-hmm. my own students is that you know the bass is a really important instrument in a band because mm-hmm. it is where the two halves mm-hmm. of music meet. In the sense that you know you can be a guitar player, mm-hmm. and if you're like the lead guitarist, you don't play any rhythm. Mm-hmm. Except your your solo lines, and if you're a drummer, all you play is rhythm. You know what I mean. You don't mm-hmm. usually have me- melody mm-hmm. uh, or harmony involved. Mm-hmm. And the bass, one of the reasons it's an important instrument, is because it's what connects those two. Mm-hmm. It's keeping the keeping the the rhythm going, mm-hmm. but it's also helping to define the harmony by throwing in those bass notes and saying mm-hmm. like, okay, we're on a C, okay, we're on an F. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So my teachers in college. And even before that, really kind of really threw that, drilled that into my head, mm-hmm. being like there was the the drums and all the percussion rhythm over here. And then there was the keyboards and the rhythm guitars and all stuff over here. And you were the guy who was had to hold them together mm-hmm. because all these guys were thinking about was the harmony. So they're going to be playing the chords and stuff like that. All these guys are really thinking about is the rhythm. So mm-hmm. if they are not in the same place... Mm-hmm. If they're not on the same page, your band is in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Okay, you know what sense. I mean? Yeah. So the bass guy, the bass player is the one who holds that together because not only is he keeping that rhythm, he's but he's it. also saying like, that's the chord, you C, and now you're down. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, the, so the question is, sometimes more is less, sometimes less is more. It it really depends on the music you're playing. That that's my the easy answer. It really depends on what you're playing. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are certain styles of music where playing less and less and less is exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, it just depends it, on the situation. Yeah, it depends like, on the yeah. situation. If you're on the recording, recording, for example, if you know during during recording, they, I would prefer somebody to play less. Right. You know, like you don't want it to be too busy. But if you're, you know, playing live and stuff, if you're playing like at a, like at a jazz club, or you know, like you're gonna want to run up those notes, you know. Yeah, a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of it has to do with musical maturity and mm-hmm. your taste. True. Yeah. When you are young, a lot of times with younger players, your technique will outrun your <laughs> your taste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I've, hey. I, I know of, I know a, uh, <laughs> a very young ukulele player that used to do that a lot. Still does sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the thing the thing of it is, it, that's pretty normal. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's be honest here. That's normal. If if we learn a that's new, what I told lit, my parents, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you told lots of things, your parents, lots of things you did was normal. <laughs> but it, it is. It's very normal because, you know, out of the two things to develop, mm-hmm. technique develops a lot faster mm-hmm. if you're practicing. If you're practicing mm-hmm. like hardcore, your technique will develop quickly. Mm-hmm. Okay? The musical maturity to know what you should be playing at any one mm-hmm. given time, that takes a little bit longer because a lot of times... You don't get that Mm -hmm. until you play with other people. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's very little ways to develop musical maturity playing by yourself. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things people do that sometimes give them a better hint. Like, uh, you know, I still do this to this day. Sometimes I'll put on like an old cool jazz record or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'll just play along. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'll try and play, you know, I'll try and like turn the bass down on the the speed, on the, the EQ so I can't really hear the bass player, and then I'll try mm. play bass lines to it, mm. and then I'll listen to what that guy was doing. You know, mm. whoever it was, whether it was yeah. Ray Brown or Paul Chambers, I'll listen to what they were doing, and li- doing that oftentimes it very much gave me an idea of, excuse me, not only what I should do, mm. but a very good idea of what I shouldn't do. <laughs> mm. I think, I think when you start off, like just because when you're just starting at music, like all of your, it's like if if you're playing an RPG, you have zero skill points, right? right. It's like nothing. You you haven't put it into anything. You haven't put it mm-hmm. into like ear training or mm-hmm. your finger dexterity or hand mm-hmm. dexterity or like any anything that's essential to playing music. Mm-hmm. And so you're just trying to hit that status quo, right? Like right. when you first right. start. So it's like, I have to play this much notes to just make that minimum amount. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when you kind of get better, it's like, oh, I can play less notes, but sound just as efficient yeah, as... Just as full. Like, yeah, or, well, or even more so. Yeah. Right? You know, one of the things, too, about that is is that we, as we listen, we're always influenced. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I teach jazz improvisation, that's one of the things that I tell the kids they have to do. You know, you can't develop generally your jazz improv skills in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. You know, I even thought like this for a way ways in college where I was like, OK, I'm going to stop listening to, you know, Coltrane and, and Charlie Parker and all those guys because I'm going to play too much like them. Mm-hmm. They're influencing me. They're influencing me yeah, too, much. too much. Get out of my head. OK, <laughs> okay. that's stupid. <laughs> I was stupid. I, could, I fully admit that. Mr. Sigurd, if you're out there, my old band director, you were right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> because what it is, is like, think about when you were like a, coming up. Yeah. And then you heard guys like Jake. I was always the man. I don't know what you're talking about. I was always the man. (laughs) And you... uh, Don't you mean... Okay. That's how we met. (laughs) That's how we met, right? Exactly. I'm the man. I'm the man, Mike. And then I got shut down. (laughs) So, um, you know, but when you were listening to that, like you hear someone like a Jake, or if you want to talk about saxophone, think about someone like Charles Coltrane, mm. and you hear him playing these, and you hear that, and you're like, oh my god, that's so amazing, yeah. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. But what you fail to realize at a young age is that the reason those guys put those notes there is because mm-hmm. they knew those notes were yeah, going to go what there. What fits. They, they knew what fit, mm-hmm. and it was... You know, even though Coltrane as a saxophone player was a great example of someone who could play a million notes a minute, mm-hmm. he was also very mature in that he was trying to create effects. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a period in the 50s and the 60s called Sheets of Sound where he was playing literally so fast that it was like waves of notes hitting you. Mm-hmm. And that was the purpose of what he was doing. Mm-hmm. But even then, even in these 30 second note runs he still knew every note uh, in the scale he was yeah, playing yeah. and he knew that he was going to back off eventually and bring it back exactly yeah. he was it was an effect well the problem is that when we're young we only hear the sheets of sound and we want to just do that without necessarily knowing the purpose knowing the purpose <laughs> of it and the thing is too at that <clears throat> at that young we probably won't be playing the correct notes necessarily <laughs> you know part of the part of the idea of the sheets of sound it was like this tonal blanket hitting you. But if you play certain incorrect notes along the way, mm-hmm. it's not going to have that effect. Matter of fact, it's going to have a much more jarring effect mm-hmm. and unpleasant effect on the listener. Yeah. So I think that, so 
you know, that going back to like, how much do you play? How do you know? A lot of that just comes with your maturity. Yeah. You know, listen to, listen to the people that you are, that you love, Mm -hmm. listen to those records, listen to all that, but realize that players like that, those great players, they're playing what they're playing on purpose. Mm -hmm. Like there is a purpose behind all of it. If you are just, Jamming out, with, and when really, let's be honest, when you're jamming out with your friends, yeah, you can be stupid sometimes <laughs> and just say, oh, I'm gonna go as fast as I possibly can. It's, it's, it's just fun to fool Sometimes, yeah, is. sometimes yeah. it is. Sometimes it is. You're just making what it, any kind of exactly. Yeah. But yeah. sometimes, other times, mm-hmm. no, you should know exactly what you're playing and why you're playing it. Mm-hmm. Why is this skill going over this chord? Because this, I think, or, or going back to like even Alan as. Uh, his growth as a player, what I really like is that he's become like a really thoughtful player mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in thinking about like, oh, like I'll add a role here because yeah. it adds to the song, mm-hmm. right? It's like you you can, there's definitely adding too much and knowing when to add makes you like, or yeah. being purposeful with what you add is makes you, in my opinion, a better player. Yeah. How, how do you um, suggest somebody mature so like you're talking about like musical maturity and stuff okay so yes you can practice you can work on your chops and get better as far as you know your um your technique and stuff you said you can get better technique and work on that how does one work on their musical maturity okay that's you know there's there's one real answer to this every time play with other people Mm -hmm. play with other people play with other people because is is there a back door perhaps to that (laughs) Is there... I mean, someone trying to do some of those things yeah. that I was talking about, like playing along with recordings you love mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That is technically a way to play with players better than you'll ever have access mm-hmm. to generally at a beginner's mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. if you're a bass player, you're not going to have access to Jacob Pistorius. Mm-hmm. One, he's dead. Two, <laughs> even if he was still alive, he a beginner be player, a, be, a beginner player. <laughs> yeah, no, really. He wouldn't want to play with you. He, 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 wouldn't, he wouldn't play with you, you know, because yeah. he, he doesn't know who you Jake are. Jake would play with me. <laughs> he wins. <laughs> so nice he's, so he's, so nice. he's so humble and he nice. Would. He played with it. Not but the, Jaka. <laughs> but you know that's but that's part of the thing right there. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, playing along with recordings does give you access to players that you are not in their league to play with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um there's uh if if there are such things in your town, your neighborhood, your city. Go to find open jam sessions. Mm -hmm. That's a great place. I developed Mm -hmm. a lot of my playing ability Mm -hmm. at here on Kauai at the Hanalei Bay Resort. Because every Mm -hmm. Sunday, they would have a jazz jam session. Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, man, I would drive out there every Sunday. I'd get up there and play two songs, which is the same two songs every time. (laughs) Um, You just have people come up. And and, and, yeah, they they would just let people come Mm -hmm. up at the end of every set and and play for like three or four songs. And I'd go up and I'd play my two songs. Mm-hmm. And then the drummer for that was a guy named Coco Kaniali'i. Oh yeah, Coco. Coco's an incredible He's player, awesome. great bass player. You might have seen him in The Descendants with George Clooney. He's the one with the huge white afro in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> he was also in Honeymoon in Vegas with Nicolas Cage. He's the guy who threw Nick Cage in jail. <laughs> but um, he was a he, he was also Don Ho's drummer for many years, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he has played in at gigs with everyone from Oscar Peterson to Elvis yeah. Presley and guys like that. So every time after that, Coco would pull me off to the side during yeah. the break and he'd say like, okay, you know, you did this pretty yeah. good. You did this pretty good. Eh, you probably don't want to do this or this or this again. Mm. Okay, that's good. Go home. Come back. Practice. Oh, come, come back next week. That's like really rich knowledge. And, it, and, and, and really, it, he didn't really say – it wasn't so much that he was like getting down to like, you are using a B-flat Mixolydian right, scale. Right. It was more like, you know that part when – you know, everybody was kind of just relaxing, mm-hmm. and then you decided to just go. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe don't do that. It's not good. That's not good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> play with that flow. Yeah, I think one of our members had a saying that, or he said, one of his teachers said, "Don't talk to uh, or don't learn from other musicians like techniques and oh, how do you hold this chord or mm-hmm. how do you pick this note mm-hmm. or play this riff, right? Don't." Don't ask them those questions. Ask them like the questions about how do you achieve this certain feeling of the song mm-hmm. or things like that. Because that's all the other stuff you can learn from, from like book. you can Google. Yeah, yeah. Or, or like there's thing specific resources that will teach mm-hmm. you exactly that. Right. 
but you can only learn like the feeling things from musicians who mm-hmm. would who have that feel. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with that to a point. Obviously, there are certain things about technique and <laughs> things like that that you can learn. Obviously, otherwise, nobody would ever take private lessons from people like us. Yeah, and, and we don't want to dissuade people from <laughs> questions. You know, so I mean, it kind of depends because, like, I feel like it's almost like you're going up in levels again. Yeah. Again, at the, at like your beginner level, there's all this technique to learn, so you can actually play something, mm-hmm. and then that part there's that later part of the journey where you're learning what to do with all of it because you can have this. It's it's almost like another uh, video. Get using another video example. It's like having like fifteen spells you could use at any one given time, but you oh, don't know which, which one, one you're going to use. You know, <laughs> obviously, if you're fighting the ice no, monster, yeah. don't use the ice spell because it's probably not going to hurt it's him. It's not you know, very effective. it's not going to be effective. <laughs> so, effective. so at the beginning, yeah, no, ask if you know someone oh, I, I like know, him I know, Mike. or I me know. or Kahai or Aaron yeah. ask us questions about stuff yeah, like that it's like well, how do how do my how do my fingers do that how yeah. how do i hold my hand but after that then it's almost yeah. like realize that everything we're teaching about technique is only the means to get to the second part mm-hmm. i think uh, yeah and in the the context of what they were saying it's like if you only have 5 minutes with that's um, true okay like, uh, yeah. uh, Musician you wouldn't you ask to, that question. Or you yeah. only have five minutes with Jake. It's like, uh, how do I play a B flat? It's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's like don't ask yeah, that. Yeah, sure, I'll show you how to play a B flat. <laughs> yeah, that's a then. wasted moment. Okay, yeah. go home, kid. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I mean, in, in that situation mm-hmm. where, you know, it's, maybe you go to someone's concert and you get like a, a five minute meet and greet with them right. or something like that, you know, okay, no, ask, ask them that question that you realize that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, but okay. So I'm I'm gonna you know I'll, I'll present it to you guys like this. What if I had just discovered the ukulele, right? And I go to Jake's concert, and currently what I'm stuck in, I've watched all the tutorials and stuff. Still, for the life of me, cannot hold a B flat or an E chord. Like I feel that like if I go and I get a five minute chance, say with Jake and stuff, I would be like, hey, look. I've, you know, I've tried everything that I could to learn how to play B flat and an E. How do you do it? I feel like that's fine, right? No, absolutely. Because, because there are definitely more important questions. Right. But here's the thing. Like mm -hmm. I said, at that point, if you only have a super limited amount of time, Mm -hmm. ask the question that is burning the hole in your head. In your head. So in that example, that is the question that is burning Mm -hmm. a hole in your head is, Mm I, I'm trying to do these two chords and I realize I'm not going to make progress forward Mm -hmm. if I don't yeah, I've been Figure trying this for out. Like 15 whole minutes. And <laughs> I feel like sometimes. Oh my God. So, now you sound like my school kids. <laughs> well, well, if you do it like that, I mean, if, if, if you're stuck at that level or mm-hmm. if you're at that level, you probably wouldn't even be thinking about the questions like, what was your thought process behind Dragon? Or, oh, yeah, what that's was, true. Yeah. What, did, what inspired you to write Heartbeat, right? Like, where <laughs> you probably are more focused Why on. Why is it that you broke up with Pure Heart? <laughs> oh, that's a lot of question, kid. Uh, everything but that. That's a never question. Uh, 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 watch out. So, <laughs> wait, so um, going back to kind of the original question, I know that it had something to do with Groove, right? We didn't right. right. It's, 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 he was that. asking about. Like how how, how is it sometimes you can play more less and get more out of it? Yeah, well, uh, but, but and, was it was it a question on like how to find the groove of an existing song or how to set the groove of a song that you are currently a part of or what is what was the question? Well, earlier I think we were talking about how you want to learn groove uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. even more so than in, in a previous podcast we talked about. That. Yeah, 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 last week. Like, and we were talking about like how you want to learn a groove and how you can learn a groove Mm -hmm. and how it can be even more important than like the actual rhythmic beats right Mm -hmm. Mm because groove and like beats are aren't necessarily the same thing no Uh, like a groove is like you're fitting in with whatever it's like an internal rhythm almost yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. okay so so Yeah. yeah in that sense you know groove is not always the equivalent of what you would consider metronomic time. Mm-hmm. You know, if you put on a click track or metronome, it's just doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Your groove might not do that. I mean, some of the best songs in the world don't do that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, since it's, it was in it's the, kind of like using that as like a rough outline for your actual. It's almost like where are you starting? Yeah. I mean, really, mm-hmm. the metronome is like where do you start, and then the music kind of takes you from there. A uh, couple good examples. Think about a song like "Stairway to Heaven." Mm-hmm. "Stairway to Heaven" starts off real slow, and it just slowly picks mm-hmm. up and goes. And you hear as they're playing, the guys start playing more, mm-hmm. a little bit more. Which we were talking about again too, as Bonham and and JPJ start playing a little bit more on that bass and drums, it starts pushing that beat a little more, mm-hmm. a little more, and a little more. Till finally, by the end of the song, we're like chugging along and chugging along and chugging along. Mm-hmm. But they're they're still. But that was a natural progression. Yeah, and they're yeah. still like cohesive. Like the groove yeah. kind of feels like they're, they're together. Like, yeah, the groove was naturally meant, meant to speed up together. in that song. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Are, are but we... so like, wait, what is the question though? What is uh, they were asking, how do you know what to accent? So I think, how so, do you know what to accent to get a better groove? So like, if you're listening to a song and there is a set groove, then okay, you're listening for accents. Yeah, I mean, if like, there's not like a stuff. set accent, like you know, the, well, there's not a universal one that'll work with everything. You definitely have to listen to the groove. There, there is basically one, one kind of universal mm-hmm. accent you want to think about. Mm-hmm. Everybody hits the chord together. That. That isn't set. That yeah, no, itself. but I'm talking it's not going to be the same like, for every song. You know? No, it's not the same for every no, song, but right. as a general rule, right, right. The, the idea is if, if, if you have three people in your group yeah. and they don't all change chords together, mm-hmm. even if by separating by milliseconds, mm-hmm. your groove will start to break down. Mm-hmm. So as a bass player, you know, if I'm going from C to F, I make sure that Guitar bam, player. I'm hitting on that yeah. C and bam, I'm hitting on that F. Whatever I put between the two, Almost doesn't. It it, it, it it almost doesn't matter. It's yeah. more it, that is definitely more contingent on what song I'm playing. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the you rest know? of the band follow you with that. Yeah, yeah. you know, if I'm playing like a ballad, mm-hmm. then C to F would be like, mm-hmm. that would be more like it. But if I'm playing like uh, for of you who know the band Tower of Power. Mm-hmm. If I'm playing a Tower of Power scene, that would be completely inappropriate. And then I would be... Yeah, yeah. You know? Because it... Now, the differences between the two are pretty obvious. Right. I'm playing about three notes in the first one and about 33 notes in the second one. Mm-hmm. But I still hit C when I was supposed to hit C, and I hit F when I was supposed to hit F. Mm-hmm. That's so to answer kind of the question about how do you know what to accent? The only thing you really need to make sure you're actually going to hitting it is mm-hmm. that chord change. If mm-hmm. you hit on that chord change, you're going to be good. You know, mm-hmm. it's up to then your musical maturity to tell you what to put between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that I think about is like reggae music where the changes for chords are on, they're still on one, but you're, you're not, you might not play the, the one. Mm-hmm. So there's like empty right. space, but yeah. you know, like. So you hit on two and four. But everybody is gonna change on the one yeah. still. And you're just holding that chord yeah. and waiting for that two yeah. and four. And if you. Yeah, you the bass player would have been there, but. You can kind of get away with changing on two and four, mm-hmm. but it, do, it definitely does not feel, it almost feels like you're off kilter mm-hmm. if you do that, right? Where if you, you're playing, if you're changing on one, then you feel like, oh, I'm changing mm. with the rest of the yeah. group, or I'm in sync with the rest of the group. Yeah, for, I mean, for example, like, like steer it up, like you yeah. steer it up, you can see. So you're like on one, I'm on two. So you hit that C on one, but I wasn't necessarily there, right? Right. But you're, well, you're holding. Oh yeah, I'm holding the C. Yeah. So according you're to you, know, and high, I should point out, there, in, I'm not hitting in it, most yeah. reggae bands. I mean, mm-hmm. not regular singles or duos, because that does change things mm-hmm. a little bit. But in almost every reggae band, somebody is always changing chords on one. Mm-hmm. It's usually the bass player, and if it's not the bass player, it's the piano player. Yeah. yeah. You know, somebody is always defining one as there. So. So maybe you don't accent hit on the one if you're the ukulele player, yeah, yeah. but you are timing your chank mm-hmm. off of that. Mm-hmm. That to, to, you yeah, know, yeah, they kind of for it yeah. or to know when to come in. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and that's kind of like what groove is, right? Like you want to, even if you're not going to play it, you still want to change with the groove. Yeah. Oh yeah, you want to feel. Play. You want to feel where you. It's 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 more like a bunch of moving parts. Mm-hmm. You're one of those moving parts, and if we take you out. The gear doesn't work so good anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But 
you have to, but you have to see where all the other gears are to make that happen. And how it fits. Mm-hmm. How it all fits yeah. together. It, you know, like it, any any analogy you want to use, gears, mm-hmm. a puzzle, something like that. Keep in mind that everybody in a group of mu- in a group of musicians has a part to play, mm-hmm. and a, a certain their instrument, their instrument mm-hmm. itself has a job to do. Mm-hmm. And as long as you do your job, mm-hmm. then so if I do my job. You can do yours mm-hmm. because if I'm to, we're trying to play straight up and I start playing all on the wrong beats, yeah, oh, your yeah, two, your two and four yeah. is going to be way off. Just like when we when we were trying, because you were still trying to figure out the the thing, you know, like I, I was having a hard time like finding where the um where we would start grooving. But once you find, yeah, once yeah. you finally found it, it's like okay, cool, because you set the groove, you know, as, as the bass player. So what what do you think? Uh, is there a hierarchy in a band like who you know who's responsible uh, for the groove? Uh, I would probably say like it's the bass player first and foremost. Oh, yeah. Not that that'd be accurate, but, <laughs> but there's you, a reason. But there's a reason mm. if you look at a lot of the biggest acts in the world, mm. like Mariah Carey's and mm. Whitney Houston's, there's a reason why the music director of their band is almost invariably the bass player. Huh. And if you don't know that, it, it pretty much. I mean, usually yeah. it's the bass player who is mm. the leader of that band. Mm. You know, when I do when I do my music festival, that's that is my job. Cool. I'm I'm the one who dictates to everybody else you're playing this you're playing this you're playing this we're doing this groove and all that stuff like that. and the reason is is again because i am the link between mm-hmm. harmony and melody mm-hmm. and rhythm i have a pretty good idea of what it's supposed to be and mm-hmm. since i'm the bass player it's like i see the pyramid growing from the bottom up mm-hmm. if you're if you're say the lead guitarist yeah not really you know what i mean mm-hmm. you kind of oh, look right. you're kind of look at the pyramid from the top right, down right, right. Right. I, I i love good drummers but like that's the thing is like uh, with a good drummer, if they're only a drummer, right? Mm. You can't be like, oh, do you know the harmony on this chord? And, <laughs> oh, oh, what about this? Should we play this and this? And then they're just like, I just, I just bang things with my hands. <laughs> like, no, no, no. To be to be fair, there's a big difference between if you, we were talking about say someone like um, who's a big rock drummer, whoever the drummer in Fall Out Boy is, okay. Mm. Let's say and Travis if we ask, Barker. Okay, so Travis Barker. <laughs> there would be a huge difference if we were trying to ask that question to Travis Barker or we were trying to ask that question of Abe Lagrimas. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Now, Abe, uh, now it being that Abe, not keep in good. mind, Abe also... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Abe's... <laughs> Abe, yeah, you won't see it. Really. Abe, your jazz chops are great, but your, your punk yeah. chops are, need work. Your drums, man. I mean, come on, Abe. <laughs> but, we're talking about groove. <laughs> Groove, baby. Now, Christ. in a way, that's almost not fair because <laughs> Abe does play other instruments yeah. that give him yeah. an idea yeah. of harmony. Knows, but yeah. really, even as a drummer at Berkeley, mm. he had to go through all the theory and harmony I and think, ear training courses that every other instrument well, had to go through. Well, I think that's like if you, you're a musician and you, you specialize in one thing, if you want to be a better musician, you'll look at the other side, right? You'll look at the rhythm or you'll look at the harmony side and say like, what can I learn of that so I, I know what to play better? It's like Ab- that thing, absolutely. Right? You, absolutely. Because, like, if, if not, like, if you're just listening to yourself, it's that thing where you're not mature. You won't be mature enough where you might just, like, play over everybody else. And then mm-hmm. it's like you're not giving the space to, exactly. like, mm-hmm. let other people breathe. And, that, and that's kind of the, one of the biggest things is knowing... Again, not not just knowing what you should play; it's all knowing what you should not play, and and that pretty much links us to uh, to musical maturity, also. Like, Again, you know, having the groove, finding the groove, hearing the groove, and following the groove, it all depends on musical maturity. Absolutely. And I would say that if you're trying to work on musical maturity, and you know you don't have other people to jam with and stuff, and like what Mike was saying, you can kind of just put a song on and follow that song, kind of jam with whoever's you know jamming on the album and stuff. You also not not only do you learn you know like what they do, what you're supposed to do, what you're not not supposed to uh, you know do do during the song, but you can also follow their groove and like how you know, how they groove. And we've we've said it time and time again here, you know, at Ukulele Underground. Like when I was starting out and stuff, I would just put a bunch of CDs on and I would follow like I'll create a boys and Pure Heart and yep. stuff. And now like whenever those songs pop up, it's like oh that's. I got that down because those are the songs that I've grew with, that I've right. matured that's, with and stuff, you know? And, and that's, like, why we kind of, we do the play-alongs, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's because we want to pass that on. We know mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. there are people who are, like, oh, I'm in the middle of India. Yeah. And I am the only ukulele player here in my, <laughs> my whatever city right. or whatever. And it's like, oh. and then, Or they say, oh, I love your play-alongs. I love playing along mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. your play-alongs. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so it's, you know, it, I, I think really like during practice when you're practicing with the record and stuff, and I tell people this, that the, you know, the record of the, the, uh, the, the song itself, the track, um, is, you know, is going to be on beats. Those are going to be perfect takes that they're doing because, you know, people go in the studio, they, they do like 50, 100 takes just to get one part right so that like uh, if you're an ukulele player, say you listen to uh, a Kyle Creator Boy song and you try to play with that song, if you play it note for note exactly phrasing everything, you basically like, you know, copied note for note the perfect phrase for Troy Fernandez. You know, that's him doing it perfectly. And if you can follow it perfectly, that's it. You know, you got the groove, you got the notes, you got the feel, you got the phrasing. I think yeah. uh, or we, we've uh, had people who like send in their videos or they've mm -hmm. done private lessons with you or done one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. coaching, right? And they'll play. And then like the first thing you ask them is like, did you play along to the recording? Yeah. Did you play along to the play along? And they're mm -hmm. like, um... No, I, I kind of just learned the right. chords and I tried playing along. I play, it's, it's played tough. by myself. Yeah, because if you're which, playing by yourself, then you you know you don't have a groove to follow. And that's yeah. like kind of where you know you if you haven't matured enough, you know we're talking about um, music maturity. If you have matured enough to like to establish a groove, especially being um, you know another callback to what you said, being a league ukulele player or you know or whatever, even just a rhythm ukulele player, uh, you know unless you've matured enough to you know to set a groove it's going to be tough to do it by yourself so that's that's why the other uh, play alongs exist and and on top of that if you are you know more be, you know beginner or an amateur type player that you haven't been out there and done it you don't even know what it, you, you you might not even have an idea what it's supposed to sound like it's true yeah. Yeah, that's like true. You, like a lot of people would say like oh reggae because every reggae is everywhere mm -hmm. but reggae is First of all, there's not just one reggae. You mean it doesn't sound like chaka 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 chaka? <laughs> what are you doing? Every song sounds like three little birds. I don't know what you're about. Well, you know, but but if you listen to like classic reggae, so modern reggae, Hawaiian yeah. style reggae, dub reggae, th there is a difference between mm. all of those. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's it's a mat it's a function of time mm. and experience to know the difference yeah, between yeah. those things. I should also point out, going back to something I said earlier, we, we from the very first time I was here, someone always said, why should you learn music theory? Mm. That thing I said about leading a band is why I learned, is one of the reasons I learned music theory. Because when we're trying to put together a song, and, you know, Aldrin has been part of this band before. He <laughs> knows. It's a lot of songs in an incredibly yeah, short, short amount time. of time. And you it's know, not like easy songs. No, it's not it's always easy songs. Long. Sometimes they're complicated. <laughs> and and I've had to yeah. do upwards of like 27, 28 songs in two days to yeah. learn for performance. Well, here's the thing. If I have a keyboard player and I say and I walk over to him and go like, um, so at this point, I want you to do um kind of like make it a happy sound there. <laughs> that, little notes. <laughs> that would be yeah. completely useless. Yeah. Whereas if I walk over to him and it's like, oh, Okay, this part, I want you to play, play a B flat major seven chord mm. because I know that will be like kind of the bright, mm. happy sound that the, the artist is looking for. I say, play me a B flat major seven. Okay, no, 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 play it with, with, uh, with this note on the top or this note mm. on the bottom. Because I learned my theory, mm. I can say that, like, recognize mm. that, mm -hmm. hear that, and then tell him that. Mm. Speaking, of, speaking of which, actually, not to go off subject and stuff. Um, but that's last, what we do. <laughs> <laughs> last week, uh, during the one-on-one um, -on -one coaching, I had a question from Trent um, asking about, um, you know, like, wanting to, like, incorporate reading, like, musical notation into the ukulele. And they're like, oh, how come you guys don't do more, mus you know, musical notation and stuff? He's talking about, like, he sees it. And he used to kind of play with, you know, with an orchestra, I believe, also. Um you know, he wants to see like the notes and stuff and he sees the uh, the value of it but I'm, I'm like okay well you know as uh and you know he's just he just started playing ukulele and stuff and like later on you can do things you know like things like that and, and look at the musical notation but for now it's good to kind of know the chords know the groove know the you know the picking think, patterns and stuff well but, and part part of it trent yeah, trent, trent, yeah. so one thing if you're watching this trent yeah, you know one is, when, when yeah. you when you're when you're starting out if you've played other instruments before, too, you understand that at the beginning, mm -hmm. it's a lot of the physical part of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Reading music is an excellent thing. I would never tell anybody, don't do that. Yeah. But maybe what, you, maybe what you're looking for, then, is wait till you get to the point 
where your basic chords are fluent. Mm -hmm. Get to the point. Uh, here's a good one that I always ask my bass students. Can you tell me where all the notes are on the fingerboard? Mm -hmm. If you can, then then you can easily move on to reading music. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. actually pretty yeah. easy from that point because yeah. you know where the notes are supposed to go. But if mm -hmm. but if you are still trying to figure out where a C is... It's like on, if, if you ask where a C is and then they're like, um... Uh, right. Exactly. If yeah. you're at that point, this fret? yeah, you should you should you should just work on that. And then, honestly, one of the things I love about being able to read is that I don't have to have a base book. Mm -hmm. I can get any book in the world because mm -hmm. notes are notes are mm -hmm. notes. And another thing that I was that I was gonna get at is um, what if because you know, he wants to you know he wants to know a little bit more about arranging stuff for the ukulele from. Uh, from musical notation mm -hmm. and stuff. So I was like, I had an idea so that the next time we bring you back, I uh, hopefully we get the rights to that, like that Simpsons song because you work on it with me. And okay. it's like one of the toughest pieces of music that I've ever, you know, that I've ever worked on. And I've, I've said that a lot. And uh, I, I found it. I yeah. found, remember that thing that we were, mm. you know, we were writing on when we figured it out. I figured I could bring it in next time, you know, next time you come and we can kind of um, like, we can break it down and what we did. Why, did we, how, pick why, why we picked those notes. And um, yeah, and just arrangement in general, like how to arrange it for you know for the ukulele and stuff. And, and by the, and, and and by the way, since that. since now that's public and we can say, yeah, yeah, he's not doing Infinity War. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, right. well, or am I just not supposed to say? <laughs> no, and <laughs> the Yeah, I know. Secret project: Infinity <laughs> yeah. War Part Two. Disney. They own you ABC. Were, they don't own Fox. <laughs> you turn to dust, and you're not turning back. <laughs> I don't feel so good, Mr. Yep. Stark. <laughs> And he's like, yep, see ya. <laughs> um, no, but, but yeah, you know, like, uh, that's what, that's what Trent, you know, and Trent actually booked a private lesson with me and he asked pretty much the same, you know, like the same question is talking about like musical notation. He's like, okay, you know, I see that this is like, it's, this, you know, this is a C and blah, 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 because it's C, E, and G like stacked up on each other. I'm like, that's good. But imagine if you're, you know, if you're handed a piece of music, like, here you go, you know, like play this for me. Then it's gonna take you kind of a long time. You're like, okay, well, that's C and that's that's E and that's G. It's got to be a C chord, you know. Like, it's not like you can just sight read it and be like, okay, cool, got it. Here's the song that I'm gonna play for you. I mean, I've I've been reading musical notation for decades now, and I still will not be able to do that so sight read stuff on the on the ukulele. Yeah, so I believe Venova, yes, yeah, Venova, yes, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but you know, like uh, I said, just. You know, with the efficiency of of tablature, that's what we we mostly turn to tablature. But in in our downloads and stuff, you have both the tab and the musical notation. So yeah. you know, if you do want to see the you know the the notes, you can you know you can see it like which notes are which and how they're stacked up and I, stuff. Uh, I, I think the thing is too that uh, it's fine learning theory. Yeah, but you got to remember at the end of the day, you shouldn't like when you're picking up your ukulele to play it. It shouldn't be like. I'm playing an A chord, now I'm playing a G chord, now I'm playing a C chord, now I'm playing these notes, A, B, C, D, E. Right. Someone take as, a clip as, of that and that would be you like, like As a matter of fact, I, not, I really agree chord. with that. As a matter of fact, that's, if you also recall, the, one of the first things I said, why you learn theory, it's yeah. not so that you, it's so that whenever you play what you love, mm -hmm. Communicate you that. you yeah. know what you, you can recognize what it is. <laughs> if you hear someone play something super cool, and so you can listen to it and go like, "That's what he's playing." It's it's, it's not it's not going from the. Yeah. You shouldn't go. You shouldn't. And Kai's exactly right. You shouldn't go from theory to playing. Mm -hmm. You should go playing, and theory is so that you understand what you're yeah. playing, mm -hmm. so you can name it. Because you always want to, if you're playing, your your first and foremost should be the emotional aspect you're bringing forth mm -hmm. with your music. Right? Absolutely. It shouldn't be like, oh, I really want to play these notes. Because when it, it's like, somebody said, like, if you're thinking while you're playing music, that's already too slow. It, it mm, has to yeah, be yeah, where yeah. it just, you're Automatic. doing it. You're mm -hmm. playing music. Yeah. Right. Well, and then I should say, though, that, that that's, a, again, a matter of degrees. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, I, of course, at the beginning, like, when you're right at the beginning... The emotional thing, that actually should be secondary to you actually making sure you put your fingers in the right place. Yeah. Because you're not going to be able to express anything if you're constantly playing the wrong chords. Mm, true. Okay? Yeah, that's true. But as you get past that, I mean, and let's be honest here, listen to the music. Mm. You can get, you can draw a, a lot of emotion out of three chords and an ukulele. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of songs that are just absolutely beautiful and deep. 
that are just three, two, one chord, whatever. It doesn't even make a difference. It's what there is, you know? And, and so rem- remember that. Then once, once you've kind of learned how to do that, then it, then it's a time to forget the technique and just let that be natural mm-hmm. because that's when you can kind of open up the, that second, and use a Naruto term now. You open up the second gate, <laughs> and, oh, and you and you start to let it, and you start to let that flow in, so there, out of you. Just the second gate, it's pretty. Yeah. There's what is it called? Venn diagrams, right? Like the ones where it's. Oh yeah. yeah. There is like a person who's like into music, Naruto, and <laughs> there's gotta games, be a. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh man, they, they hit all the right things. <laughs> I love yeah. this podcast. Oh. If that's what if that is Final you, Fantasy. if that is you, you are in the right place, my friend. Yeah, yeah if you have any like wrestling too, we got a podcast coming up just oh. for you. <laughs> <laughs> Music and wrestling. I, I, uh, I want to mention that I think uh, so. Trent and Alan, they were both mm-hmm. saying that uh, they. Try, they learn music theory and that helped them kind of like yeah, understand yeah. the why and that, that should but I think it's just uh, we want to mention that it's like music theory to me was always like the it's, if you're learning a language it's like learning how to write out a language yeah. and read yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and if you, you put all your effort into that it's like oh great you can yeah. you know write a, mm-hmm. a letter to somebody mm-hmm. but would you be able to speak to somebody like in a fluent yeah. conversation so oh, okay now, as a counter to that, though, you're you're talking about thinking of music theory as like the syntax of a language, yeah. like what goes where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that means would you be able to speak to someone without knowing any of that? Absolutely, but you might end up talking like Yoda and putting the subject and the predicate in the wrong place. Yeah, or, or mm-hmm. like uh, there is, um, it's kind of like uh, uh, exactly like talking like Yoda. But then you hear somebody who learn only from reading or like learn from, you know, uh, language books, right? And it's like, oh. It, it's very stiff. It's very yeah, stiff. Grammar yeah. is in, it, it's like technically correct, but, mm-hmm. you know. Like, so, the, and so really, it's, it's kind of a combination of all things. And that's why, like, there's not any part that we're discouraging you from learning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then really, I would just say, to be the most complete musician you can Too be, both. even even yeah. if you're not, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter if you want to be like a professional. I mean, yeah. if you trust me, if you want to be a professional, you this is stuff you should to, learn. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're, but if you're looking to just have fun with your friends, yeah, you don't necessarily have to learn all of it. But I yeah. promise it's you, great. it will, it, yeah, it will deepen great. your appreciation mm-hmm. of what it is. Yeah. To go into his language example, yeah. This is a C, third finger on the bottom. That's like learning yeah. the, your letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then C, and then C, learn how to do like G. C, C, F, G, seven. That's mm. like you know words mm. and uh, this is my dog <laughs> kind of thing. But eventually, if you speak, learn to speak a foreign language, you know, you're not uh, thinking about those. Yeah, things. you're not thinking about it. and 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 if you're you speaking a foreign the, language, mm. what you also got to remember is eventually you're gonna wonder. You, if you learn to translate everything, mm-hmm. right, you'll you'll understand that say in Japanese, the subject and the the get switched around. Yeah. yeah. And if you translate it word for word, you're gonna be eventually like, wait. Yes, so if I translated sense. this sentence, word yeah. into English, mm-hmm. it would be like the the bite of the dog was to the man. Yeah. <laughs> you know the fish. <laughs> you know the, the fish was good. He's like no. Oh. Good the fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, see, yeah, for yes. a complete side thing, that's why pigeon is structured like that because yeah, Japanese, all, because Japanese, Chinese, Chinese all these people who had reversed, yeah. flipped language yeah. uh, subject and predicates. I didn't. Okay, it, like when I came in, you know, I mean, I'm I'm from the Philippines when I first came into Hawaii and stuff, and I was, you know, I, English is my second language, but it just sounded so weird to me. I felt like. This isn't the English that I learned. I'm like, did I learn the wrong English? Because I was listening to all the other kids speak. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what? You really <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, like, I was trying to wonder what you think. Yeah. Oh, because you were hearing everybody speak pigeon. Yeah, everyone's speaking pigeon. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, what? What? <laughs> was gotta, so go talk to, gotta talk to the teacher after school. Because I just... I- I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just learned from the books, just like what you know, what Kahai was saying. Like I, you know, I can't. I guess I can speak, but not, you know, but not the. Yeah. So, so in essence, it, eventually, the music theory is learning mm-hmm. why is the subject the last thing in the sentence? Why is that there? Mm-hmm. I think, mean, and it, it allows you to then be free with that framework because prior to that, then you're a lot of it is you're stuck in that sense of you can only say the phrases you have memorized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? The theory of the language, like, 
will allow you to rearrange it and then create Express, the new sentences like, for yourself. Yeah. yeah. If you go to like a, a Japanese uh, school or class, like the thing that they, they always teach is like, Watashi no namae wa kai des. Dozo yoroshiku ni gashimasu. Kai. No actually says that in real life. Yeah. Kai yeah. son. Yeah. Nobody introduces themselves like that in Japan. Like they, they'll get it. And yeah. they'll, it kind of, it's like a blaring red sign that, oh, this person and <laughs> tourist. Oh, yeah, like yeah. Mm. This ramen is now ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I think the same thing for music, right? Like it, it's okay to oh. if you're at that level, that's perfectly fine, mm. and you'll get your point across, yeah. and people will listen and be able to understand you. Yeah. But you want to get it to a point where you're more fluent, and you just say, "Hi, my name's Kahai." Or yeah, hi, give me that ramen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It Please. is good that if you, if you want to jam with you know as much people and. That this, that's what this entire episode is about instead of getting musical maturity you know like and jamming with jamming people and groove and stuff um if you know the theory like uh that means you you know more words you can communicate you know with, right. with more people and stuff so yeah and so you would, can also you create say that different genres are like different languages even like you're, you're using oh, i would say i would say similar, similar similar i would say they're more like different dialects okay okay, okay because okay. it's almost like they're because i mean hmm. There's English, mm-hmm. and then there's Pigeon English, and then there's, like, Cajun English, and then mm-hmm. Deep South and Texas. Yeah. You it, know? It, it might be, like, or how I would think of it, maybe, like, genres are languages, and then, like, subgenres of where, like, there's different types of radio Could be. and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, like the, the, I think the reason I think of different music styles as dialects rather than whole different languages you can still is speak. that... Whether you're playing classical mm-hmm. European music mm-hmm. or Zydeco music from New Orleans or cowboy mu- or hillbilly yeah. music, mm-hmm. whatever, bluegrass, whatever, it's all still based on that mm-hmm. Western ideal. Yeah. The same so like the, the, same, same, the same 12 same karatic alphabet. notes and the chord progressions mm-hmm. and with majors sure. and minors and stuff like that. Now, that being said, if we were to go to Japan... Yeah, that's a music tones. different language, yeah. or India, or, or uh, India, uh, or China. Those would would be I consider it to be different languages, mm-hmm. music yeah. languages, mm-hmm. because it does come completely different. Mm-hmm. I've has anybody ever seen music written in Japanese? No, it's no. crazy. Look really? at how, how yeah, do they, they even yeah. Uh, notate it. It looks. It just looks like just kanji everywhere. Wait, really? what? They, what? They, they <laughs> don't use a staff. They don't. Not that the ones I saw, no. Oh, really? Yeah, so they <laughs> so they do a different way. They do it a different way. Mm. So for that, I would say anything that's Western music based is un, falls into that one umbrella, mm. and that's the language. It's and English, jazz, right? and blues, mm-hmm. and rap, dialects. and and rock are all dialects yeah. thereof because they're all basically using the same. It's almost like a like foundation, Latin, right? Like yeah, Latin really. is the foundation for a lot of yeah mm. exactly. Languages. Whereas if we move into certain other countries, African music. Did not draw at did not draw at all from the European influence. At least not until later. Some some of it later, did. but rhythm. traditional yeah. African music absolutely did not. Mm. Funny enough, though, African music is an is part of the dialect of American mm. music, Western music. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't it didn't flow back the other way. But if we go mm. to China or Japan or India or mm. any of those countries, the the syntax is now different. What the, how they put notes together is different. He was saying half tones. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you ever want to see something really weird, look up quarter tone pianos on YouTube. <laughs> it, uh, really? So it's a it's piano crazy. where each key going up is half of the half step that we talked about. <laughs> oh, wow. So the note that they're trying to hit, if you look right over here, here's my fret. So here to there is a half step going from this open string to this first fret. The quarter tone is somewhere around here. In between. <laughs> In between, yeah. Yeah. And it would have to be a fretless instrument for it to work, but yeah. So to our ears, oh, yeah, that's, it that's just sounds I mean. like I mean, a like just half of the yeah. Uh, you know? It just sounds like a bunch of flat and sharp notes, mm. but to not to them. Yeah, there's things you know, between. I went to college with a bunch of guys from like China mm. who were trained in like Chinese singing, mm. and they can they can not only hear it, they can sing it. You can hit it. It's hit crazy, you that know. Like they can sit. Like I heard one of them <laughs> sing like a two octave. Scale, but in quarter tones. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's, and that's probably, like, for them, they probably hear, like, Western music singing or Western music, and then they're like, why is everything out of tune? <laughs> Have you... No, 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 the intonation, actually, funny enough, is the same. Mm-hmm. But what they hear is, man, 
You're only using you, half. Of you're only using half of the notes. <laughs> you guys are really. You guys make really simple music. Yeah. I, I, as a matter of fact, I uh, one of my roommates, my first semester, was a composition major mm. from from Hong Kong, <laughs> and he said it was really interesting learning this, learning how to write American music. It's like this is so much easier. <laughs> this is way easier than what I was oh. doing. Are you kidding? <laughs> Because you know a, a two octave scale mm-hmm. for Americans would be sixteen notes. Mm-hmm. So he heard thirty. So with so he had thirty two <laughs> notes in that same space. Thirty two <laughs> possibilities, yeah, yeah. and he was like, "But he, since he was writing in Western music, mm-hmm. he was only using those sixteen, and he was like, this is easy." <laughs> <laughs> a cool um, uh, YouTube. I forgot what the channel is called, but there's a YouTube series where they uh, where they do kind of. Um, uh, like a like an Asian uh, or like Japanese, it's by yeah NHK. Like did a um you know did this series like they they did covers like American covers and stuff like rock and roll covers, but they did it with like shamisens and cultures and stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> I think I see that. Is so, that the, yeah. is that the one who does like the Asian issue? Was it Stairway to Heaven? Yeah, yeah. There's a Stairway to Heaven one, and there's there's a bunch, and they're all super good. I is it the one with the lady in the big strange one? That goes there's like, like this? different kinds, like okay. Because so that's one video, and there's another video that does. Because like, that's how I saw things. Japanese music. It's amazing. A good friend of mine named uh, Oh the Koto. Yeah, Ro- Rosie Alfiller. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. played Koto, mm-hmm. and so she showed me like her music books, mm-hmm. and it just looked like just regular. <laughs> it wasn't staffs and dots going up and down. They uh. actually don't do that. It's. Uh. In her music books, it was basically just all kanji writing. I've, I've always wanted to learn how to play shamisen. I figured it's kind of like uh, Luke Kalala, but with, like, with that big pick, gigantic or, pick and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm pretty good with my left hand and stuff. Like, let me try that out. Well, and, you, then, just and, and we'll add a balalaika after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, this has been great. Every can time we, you're here, it's been awesome. Yes. Can we do one last question real quick? Absolutely. Uh, okay. I'll talk about it. <laughs> it's 207 already. So... Uh, so this is trend again. So a major yeah. chord is one three five, and a minor chord is one flat three five. Yes, correct. Uh, what are and you kind of ask like if there's a sharp like a like if it's supposed to be sharp, you know the the flat. <laughs> what what I think he's I think he's overthinking it. So one flat three five. Oh no, I should let the uh, I should let the music expert. Okay, <laughs> is it always going to be a flat? No. What it's telling you is you use the first note of the scale. The third note of the scale, which is made flat by a half step, and then the fifth note. Yeah, It's always okay? relative. It's always relative to the key you're working in. So if you're working in a key that has a ton of sharps in it, no, that might still end up being yeah. like C sharp as the note, but it's still considered the flat third because it's mm-hmm. the third note that was this, and now it's flattened by a third, by or a half step. Or it might even be like a natural or something. Because yeah, exactly. The, uh, yeah. the third was sharp already. Like, for example, like uh, like an A chord, right? So right, an A chord. Versus an A minor chord. Right. Well, that'd be A, C sharp, E yeah. versus so A, C, E. So the sharp, you know, you drop the sharp because it's a half step down. Yeah. 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 So flattening just means flattening it, means you're lowering it by a half step. Lowering yeah. it by yeah. Half. So it's not necessarily like that no, flat no, note. Yeah, yeah it's not right. a flat note. In the key it's of just, C, that would be true because yeah. you're going from C E G to C E flat G. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's plenty of keys that have sharps where the third note would be mm-hmm. a sharp note, and then you just bring it down to a natural note because that's blowing mm-hmm. it down a half step. I can't think of any one that there, there's none that that start so high up it comes down to a flat. To go, it goes down to a sharp because it would so be a like double sharp, like a double sharp. Yeah, chord, you, you like don't do it. third. Although double sharp is there a double third, f- like a double sharp third in in any scale. Is there a scale with a double sharp? Not, third? not, no, not right? from not going from major yeah. to minor. No. Now, if you start doing other alterations, yes, <laughs> maybe in Shanghai. Yeah, <laughs> in <yet>. Shanghai, <laughs> there's definitely that so three flats. Koto music flat to tisisimo. All right, Kahai. Um, is there, I hope is there that answered your question before, Trent. You know, before we uh, say the final things. I don't. So Trent asked, Sorry. "How is a sharp found?" But how, you have to be more specific. Yeah, Trent. yeah I, I think. Yeah, Trent. I think. I think I mean, yeah, if you take a look at mm-hmm. the music theory. All right, wait, wait. I can do this. <gasps> okay, here's what you're looking for. Um, when you're talking about sharps, it depends on the key you're playing in. Certain mm-hmm. half the half the half the keys are. The, the accidents are all found in flats. The other half are all found in sharps. So where do you find a sharp? If you are being, making a chord based on one of those major keys that has all the sharps in the key signature, then the notes sharps. would be sharps. For instance, in the key of C sharp, it would be C sharp, E sharp, G sharp. That's when you would find sharps in the key itself. There's, there's 
there's mm-hmm. no such thing as like necessarily an E sharp, but you call it E sharp yeah. just because of it's, the key. Yeah. That you're, you're there is an E sharp. There's yeah. It's the same as an F. 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 You will find E sharp in like keys like the key of C sharp that already have. Yeah. Whereas the E sharp and the F sharp is yeah because you, you can't have an F. And an F sharp in the same scale. That's right. So you That's would have an E sharp to uh, to say that. I think mean, yeah. yeah. you might be getting confused by like the naming system, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But that's where it's like in that those cases, you just kind of stick with it to make the sys- whole system yeah more work. conducive. Really, yeah. Yeah. And I realize this can be confusing as all get out. So if you have any more questions, shoot them an email and they can forward it to me, yeah. and I can I'd be happy to answer. It's yeah. really like uh, if. If you watch the music theory um, ukulele underground university, it should say it in there because yeah. we have we we've done one. And, yeah, we yeah. went over all that stuff. So, so if you check out music theory over on UU University, I, that should explain everything. I, but if you you guys do have questions for Mike, like yeah. oh yeah, like, definitely. Like let, let us know yeah. in the email. Like mm-hmm. hey, I want to ask Mike this. And we can either forward it to him or mm-hmm. we can save it for when he yeah. comes back on the show. Yeah, we like to save it so that. We get the raw answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Mike, for coming in. Thanks for giving right. your time. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. On behalf of myself, Aaron Nakamura, Kahai Fergan, we have uh, Songs Made Easy after this. And after that, we have one-on-one coaching. Uh, tomorrow, we have the very first um, Songs Made Easy jam right before the Law Friday Live jam. So make sure you tune in for that. If you're tuning in for uh, Songs Made Easy, Check the Songs Made Easy Jam tomorrow. That's going to be at, uh, I believe, 12 o'clock to about 12.45. So 12 to 12.45, a 45-minute jam. And then at 1 o'clock, then we have a lower Friday, uh, regular Lower Friday Live Jam. So come uh, join us for that. Yes, Kahai. Uh, you might want to mention Daylight Savings. Yes, Daylight Savings for those of you folks who don't know. Hawaii does not uh, observe Daylight Savings. Part so yeah, <laughs> we don't observe daylight savings. So just uh, just keep that in mind. So if you if you do live in a state that does, um, you know, uh, use daylight savings, know that uh, Hawaii does not change. So make your uh, proper adjustments. Uh, you can Google up time in Hawaii to kind of uh, you know get a get a better idea of when we're going to be uh, doing our streams. Okay, so thank you so much. Have a good one. Aloha. Stay tuned in a few minutes. <laughs>